Chapter 21 Asking for a Napoleon from Within Political Cynicisms 5 Training for Fact People Quoting Oswald Spinkler from Pessimism, question mark We Germans will manage to produce not another Goethe, but a Caesar. Quoting Oswald Spengler's De Untergang des Abendlandes from Munich, 1922-1979 edition, pages 1097-98. For us, the age of warring states began with Napoleon and the violence of his measures. In his mind, the thought of a military, and at the same time national, world domination, occurred for the first time. This century is the century of huge standing armies and universal conscription. Since Napoleon, hundreds of thousands and finally millions stand continually ready to march. Enormous fleets lie at anchor that are renewed every ten years. It is a war without war. A war of outdoing the other with armaments and strike capability. A war of numbers, of tempo, of technology. The longer the discharge is postponed, the more monstrous the means become, the more unbearable the tension becomes. The great centres of power in the world capitals will dispose of smaller states, their territory, their economy and people according to whim. All that is still only province, object, means to an end. Its fate is without importance in the great course of things. In a matter of years we have learned to scarcely notice events that before the war would have transfixed the world. Who today still thinks seriously of the millions who perish in Russia? The Napoleonism of the Weimar Republic betrays the convolutions and crises with which petty bourgeois and cultivated bourgeois people at the time entered into a century of strategy. Today that is called often with a completely wrong emphasis, the quote-unquote politicization of the intelligentsia, or the politicization of the masses. In reality, the First World War had been the mass politicizer. For years on end, it had transformed the consciousness of the entire continent into those of observers of the front. Being schooled through war reports, every individual developed the perspective of a general, The feeling grew that those who were not generals could only be tiny cogs in the war machine. For four long years, reports on the war bombarded public consciousness. Here for the first time, that overwhelming socialization of attention characteristic of modernity, uh, here for the first time, that overwhelming socialization of attention characteristic of modernity took place. And what awoke in individuals and groups as quote-unquote political consciousness was the optics of the observer of catastrophes, of the war voyeur. The so-called politicization proceeds from a mere intensive militarization and strategic mobilization of consciousnesses, and that not only on the surface, it penetrates deep into body postures and structures of perception. In 1912, Walther Rathenau had referred to a, quote, education for becoming a politician, end quote, when the conceptual models of tactics, of the estimation of total situations, etc., trickled down as far as the shopkeeper. From then on, it took only a short time for politicization, as strategic co-thinking and large-scale catastrophes to become universal consciousness. More than ever, it became a mass reality in the chaos of the Weimar system of Weltanschauung and political parties. At the same time, however, the collective consciousness displayed a tendency to resist this kind of politicization. Nausea about politics was one of the strongest psychopolitical currents of those years. The populist side in particular profited from it because it recommended itself less as a quote-unquote party than as a quote-unquote movement. As the political ego strives for hardness and agility, it is trained in the way of seeing of generals and diplomats. Reconnoiter the terrain. Coldly consider the given circumstances. Survey the numbers. Tack as long as necessary. Strike as soon as the time is right. Communist rhetoric referred to these forms of calculation emphatically as 
quote, thinking in terms of relationships, end quote, and claimed that that was the dialectical knowledge of the whole. See my critique in chapter 11. The relationships are those Spengler startlingly designated as war without war. In this cold romanticism of grand strategic overviews, the political camps of the left and the right are quite close to each other. Those real politic ways of thinking now penetrate down to the person on the street. This quote-unquote sovereign thinking, borrowed statesman's optics and general's disposition work on posturingly, even in the minds of the impotent. The principal psychopolitical model of the coming decades and the co-thinking cog in the machinery. Those who are infected with the cold intoxication of, quote, thinking in terms of relationships, will more easily let themselves be made into the political tools of the future. The Napoleon cult in the Weimar Republic belongs in this framework. It marks a phase of inner political colonisation. With it, political masochism ascends to new heights. The small ego learns how to deliriously think in parallel with the trains of thought of a great strategic brain which disposes of the former. What Ernst Junger had previously demonstrated on a high essayistic level, namely the illusion trick of being simultaneously general and victim, caterpillar and leaf, is translated onto a mediocre level by innumerable biographies, plays and articles on Napoleon, and other men of action such as Cecil Rhodes and Warren Hastings. Here, educated and quote-unquote semi-educated, everyday sadomasochism finds expression. The leaf dreams of being the master ego of the caterpillar. The communality. The communality between the devouring and the devoured arises through the leaf feeling into the suffering soul of the caterpillar. Napoleon is portrayed as a demonically driven person, as a sufferer who has to make others suffer, even Goethe saw Napoleon as a Prometheus figure. The Weimar biographies further reinforce this. Napoleon races along his gleaming course like a meteor, quoting Kircheisen. His glowing illuminates the more sombre plight of mediocre individuals who dream themselves into the quote-unquote great man. For Spengler, who mentions Napoleon I about 40 times in the two volumes of De Untergang des Abendlandes, Decline of the West, the Corsican is the model figure of European fate. His emergence marks a precise moment in the biographical curve of European culture. Quoting from page 1081, Now we have entered the age of enormous struggles, where we find ourselves today, in the tradition from... In the transition from Napoleonism to Caesarism, a general stage of development encompassing at least two centuries that can be demonstrated in all cultures. In Spengler's style we find the apex of political botany that, even more radically than the writings of Ernst Junger, brings together the perspective of the botanist with that of the politician, of the historian with that of the strategist in a sadomasochistic unity. Quote from 1116. Cultures, living beings of the highest order, grow up in a noble purposelessness like flowers in a field. But what is politics? The art of the possible. It's an old word, and with it, almost everything is said. The great statesman is the gardener of the people. The politician of Napoleon's ilk is the fact person par excellence. Quoting page 1112. The fact person never comes into danger of propagating a programmatic or emotional politics. He does not believe in great words. He continually has the question of Pilate on his lips. Reader's note, uh, Pilate as in Pontius Pilate here. He continually has the question of Pilate on his lips. Truths. The born statesman stands beyond true and false. In similar tones interspersed with liberal, individualist, psychologizing shades, Emil Ludwig, the most famous Napoleon biographer of the Weimar years, also painted his picture of the hero. Napoleon, published 1925, was one of the most widely read books of the decade. 
it narrates in the present tense the epic of the modern man of action who is inspired by a heroic cynicism page 414 that quote through an inner drive he burns up his life energy in a fireworks of campaigns and political actions brilliant sober imaginative positivistic power hungry swayable full of courage and calculation imbued with the quote-unquote productive lack of conviction of the born player and shaper who was called on to live out his quote-unquote amoral act of force quoting page 645 the fortune of this man's life exhausted itself in works. He enjoyed nothing other than the completed deed. Only the new matter-of-factness of the post-war era allowed historians and biographers to see the Napoleonic cynicisms, his sober attitude towards success, his ambitionless ambition now, in retrospect, seems to fill itself with the Weimar life feeling. In Napoleon one sees reflected how oneself lives, and a self-assertion that at the same time let itself be driven from pillar to post by opportunities and circumstances. Half directing subject, half servile instrument of historical fate. It is precisely this alertness and letting oneself be carried along on the stream of the possible, which is well portrayed by Ludwig, that brings the Napoleonic ego into a simultaneity with the moods self-reflections, dreams and plans of the Weimar life feeling, wave riding on the harsh zeitgeist, strategic presence, a cynical affirmation of all the quote-unquote necessary horrors of politics and business. Ludwig writes about the still very young Lieutenant Bonaparte in the garrison of Valence on the Rhone, quoting pages 19 to 20, before his decisive matter-of-factness, before this gaze of the realist, the most popular author of those years, Rousseau, wilts. The excerpts on Rousseau's origins of the human species are continually interrupted by the resolutely repeated words, I don't believe a word of it. The biographer succeeds in drawing a fascinating parallel in his description of the famous encounter between Napoleon and Goethe, where the emperor said, in reference to the poet, Voilà un homme. Uh, quoting page 323. It is as if two demons recognised each other in the vapours. It is a moment in the course of millennia that is comparable only to the legend of the encounter between Diogenes and Alexander. It is particularly in misfortune, however, that the ironic gambler's nature of Napoleonic realism reveals itself that capacity of hard egos to withstand the failure of the plans and hopes. In the end, only an agile energy and a will to survive without illusions remain. Ludwig puts the following words into Napoleon's mouth during the retreat from Moscow through Poland, after his Russian campaign had sacrificed half a million lives. Pages 416 to 17. That is a grand political drama. He who risks nothing gains nothing. From the sublime to the ridiculous is only a small step. Who could have reckoned with the burning of Moscow? Napoleon becomes an adventurer. To the Poles, he pretended to have an army that had long since perished. In the meantime, he lets historical comparisons of global expansiveness light up, takes what is happening at that moment of past history, relies on premonitions and repeats four times the cynically grandiose sentence about the sublime and the ridiculous, which anticipates any critique. The world, and what he does with it, begin to become a drama for the great realist. And so, Napoleon slowly ascends the stage of elevated irony as his success descends. With such <coughs> psychological sketches, Emil Ludwig shows himself to be far superior to Spengler's brutal realism. At the highest point of realism, it is revealed how a hard sense for the facts slides over into the fictional, the histrionic, bluff and irony. With this, Ludwig touches on the blind spot in the consciousness of the philosopher of history, Spengler, who was so proud of his hard posture and his Prussian and Roman ethics with which he wanted to cover up just how much vulnerability, softness and unhappiness, just how many suppressed tears and how much resentment there had been in his life. 
He was right in seeing himself as the congenial successor of Nietzsche. Spengler was driven into the arms of the right because after his success he repressed within himself by force the self-experience of doubt and weakness, which for him had been extraordinarily strong before his big breakthrough in 1918. The literate Ludwig saw a series of traits in the fact person, Napoleon, that escaped Spengler's notice. Precisely the conmans element, the factors of seduction and drama, of diplomacy and cynical flight into a false candidness. Spengler should have had every reason to take more notice of such a phenomena. His self-observation failed from that moment on when he began to stage the drama of the great theoretician and friend of the powerful. This lion dealing with himself also tainted his theory of Caesarism. With a little more honestly, with a little more honestly regarding his own psychic structure, Spengler could have easily known that the Germans would bring forth not another Caesar, but a sick, lacrimose actor, who, to the applause of confused masses, would oblige with a suicidal Caesar number. In these times, only a psychologist or a dramatist has a chance of remaining a realist. Nietzsche's prognosis of the ascent of the dramatic character type degrades the quote-unquote respectable forms of realism to positivistic, one-dimensional worldviews of a pre-modern type. Those who do not see the histrionics in reality also do not see reality. Emil Ludwig, in any case, was on the right track when he describes Napoleon's death scene on St. Helena from pages 649 to 50. Napoleon's mood swings between pathos and irony. When a servant announces the passage of a comet, the emperor says, that was the sign before the death of Caesar. But when the doctor maintained that he found nothing wrong, the patient said, it can be done without comets too. The year is 1925. It is the year of Reich President Friedrich Ebert's death when with whose name the social democratic pseudo-realism in the Weimar Republic will always be connected. It is the year in which Hindenburg, the victor of Tannenberg, is elected as Ebert's successor. Whether the aged officer ever understood at all the time and the realities in which he was living is questionable. It is the year in which the communists, by putting up Thälmann, a symbolic candidate with no chance of winning, brought the senile reactionary Hindenburg into the presidential office because they withdrew their support from the promising opposite candidate, a centrist politician by the name of Marx. However, they pursued a quote-unquote grand strategy with hyper-realistic traits that hindered them from correctly understanding their role in these kinds of trivial quote-unquote, surface phenomena. Heinrich Mann, too, is connected with this date. He, too, had been named as a symbolic presidential candidate by certain leftist groups and some, quote-unquote, intellectuals. In this year, Mann wrote his essay on Napoleon's memoirs. For him, Bonaparte embodies a utopian dimension. The Corsican is a projection figure for left liberal dreams of real politic, in which the otherwise scarcely thinkable could happen the union of spirit and deed, ideas and canons. Heinrich Mann looks resolutely past the emperor's quote-unquote productive cynicism and his misanthropic traits. Even the fact that Napoleon had contempt for intellectuals is no longer a drawback. In viewing the emperor of the French people, the liberal intelligentsia of Weimar, not at all far removed from Jung's sturdiness, got the idea that the quote-unquote bloody incision must be consented to if it is to be executed by a man of this calibre. Under the sign of Napoleon, the liberal horror of Machiavellianisms slackens off when the latter know how to conceal themselves by citing great ideas and hard necessities. A quote here from Heinrich Mann's Geist und Tat essays, Munich, 1963, pages 125-29. The book to which I return most frequently is Napoleon's memoirs. He wrote them in the third person, which has, and is supposed to have, the effect of divine impersonality. In them, he has not so much glorified himself as honoured destiny, which wanted such things from him, and which justified him in everything. 
from a vantage point that is unique and is called St. Helena. He showed the becoming and consummation of the great man. The great man, whom this writer knew, came into the world like a cannonball into a battle. The revolution sent him in this way. In life he was one with his idea, had the same body, the same path. The liberal idea dies, it no longer exists, but Napoleon grows incessantly. Europe finally approaches the United States, which he had wanted. The genius of Europe begins a hundred years too late to reach what is due him. The genius of Europe now stands here and there, dictatorship as well. His liberal contemporaries only bore it without understanding it. He was the protector of the propertyless. What he delayed with his dictatorship was precisely what stormed in after his downfall, the rule of money. National military dictatorship erected against all merely material powers by the power of spirit. He himself is the leader of today, the intellectual who reaches for force. Wherever today a kind of leader has to go at the future of humanity, it is always this kind of leader. His memoirs are our handbook. We automatically are on his side. It is all too clear that he would hate and overthrow what is now called democracy, and which would seem to him like its disfigured mask. Such trains of thought were later referred to by Herbert Marcuse as, quote, self-dissolution of liberalism, end quote. Around 1925, even liberal intellects of high standing were prepared to throw their own traditions of ideas overboard like illusions. Spengler saw before us only a Prussian perseverance in the evening twilight of a civilization with rigor mortis. Heinrich Mann dreamed of a bright future. When the first volume of Untergang des Abendlands appeared in 1918, Heinrich Mann caused a French revolutionary to say in a scene he wrote at that time, quoting here from Geist und Tat, page 137, It, the power of reason, however, grows secretly in all of us. Catastrophes only accelerate its growth. Catastrophes thus bring us closer to happiness. We want the catastrophes basically not because we are depraved, but because we want happiness. 